Good afternoon, everyone. Nice to see you here. Um, perhaps I should tell you a little bit about, a little bit about Mr. Nurks, uh, he who uh, well, might have been the most important development economist, one of the most important. And just like Schumpeter, he actually combined innovation and finance, innovation and the real economy. And he, he, he grew up here in Tallinn with a... Uh, Estonian father and a mother who came from the small uh, Swedish-speaking minority in the, in the outer islands of, of Estonia, who had been here since the Viking Age. That's why his first name was Ragnar. So he, speak, he spoke Estonian and, and Swedish at home. He went to the uh, gymnasium, which at the time was taught in German. Uh, he did his music lessons in French. And then he went to Edinburgh to study. So, so he's one, one, one of these um, uh, cosmopolitan people from, from a very small country. And he spent his career uh, in, in the League of Nations in Geneva, uh, most of it, and, and uh, died, unfortunately, very young. So, so uh, we, we decided to, 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 to name the school after him, and we, we, we managed to get the Estonian post office to issue a stamp and created some some publicity around the 100th anniversary of his, of his birth. So perhaps I should tell you briefly why I am here. I come from Norway, and by a strange coincidence, at the age of 18, I ended up in Peru uh, and wondered about poverty, which I never met. Uh, so I observed people who, the, the same people who were doing the same things I saw in Norway, they were equally efficient, so the guy, uh, dragging the luggage at the airport, the taxi driver, the bus driver, the waiter, the barbers, all of these people were, had the same efficiency as those who did the same thing in Norway. So my question was, well, why is it that people with the same efficiency are rewarded so differently around the world? I obviously had this idea of a kind of a hierarchy, right? And, and um, uh, well, no, why did the bus driver in Norway make 20 times as much money as that, the one in Peru? It was obviously more difficult to drive a bus in Peru. So I, I decided to, to look up in a dictionary when I came home. I, I didn't really find a good answer, and 40 years later I published a book about it. Um, so uh, I spent 1968 as a very young man, you know, these... The, the revolutions of 1968 on seen from the top of the Andes, and from the top of the Andes, they looked very different than what they did in Europe and, 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 and in the US. So I started my career as a Latin Americanist, uh, working at the uh, University of St. Gallen in Switzerland, uh, at the Latin American Institute, and uh, then I went to Harvard Business School to study, and at Harvard Business School, I finally found the beginning of a reply to my question from Peru, uh, because I took a course in history of economic thought. And the guy who taught that was an elderly gentleman called Arthur Smithis. And Arthur Smithis had been the closest friend of Schumpeter uh, at Harvard. And the whole class of the history of economic thought essentially became a course in Schumpeterian economics. You know, he didn't do his job. He only talked about Schumpeter. He was supposed to talk about everything else. So that, that, that convinced me. And Arthur Smith was actually the guy, he was an Australian. He was the guy who, 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 wrote, um, uh, who wrote the obituary in, of, of Schumpeter in the, in, in, in the economic journal. So um, uh, I went into business ran three manufacturing companies for many years, and, and I took a PhD at, in economics at Cornell. And then uh, uh, after, uh, well, in 1991, I sold out my business and went back into academia. So that's, 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 uh, that's my story. So um, I was thinking of breaking this uh, session into two. First, we talk about the, the long view, and then we say, "Well, what, what does it mean? What, what does it mean today?" I thought it's useful if you are an economist to actually think, "Well, what was it before the market? 
what was there before the market. Right? And a book I would recommend is Karl Polanyi's The Great Transformation from 1944. He actually explains how the world was working. Uh, and he defines capitalism as uh, adding three fictitious commodities to society which was there before. You know, before capitalism, you didn't have money, uh, you didn't have labor as a commodity, and you didn't have private ownership of land. Right? I've been fortunate to work with the uh, reindeer herders in northern Scandinavia, and internally, they still work like this. They, they, there's no money, everybody, uh, everyone is like a big, big family, and, and, and Work is shared like it is inside the family. Um, so there is not, labor is not a commodity, um, and there's no private ownership of land. So you find that in the high Andes, which I studied at one point, you, know, you find the same economic structure as, in, um, as you find in northern, northern Norway. Uh, I think one interesting observation is that uh, the mode of production, in many ways, will, will, will determine institutions, how a society works. So if you, if you will find a, a great similarity of, of um, um, great similarity between herders in the high Andes and herders in the Arctic. Right? So talking about modes of production, I don't know if you're aware that two days ago was the 150th anniversary of the first edition of Karl Marx, Das Kapital. Uh, in 150th anniversary. Not, I'm, not that I'm a Marxist, I belong to the school that uh, Marx had a lot of good ideas and everything which is wrong with Marx was, is what he got from David Ricardo. Uh, so, so, so like the David theory of, <laughs> theory of value. So uh, mode of production I think is, is, a useful, is a useful thing. And now when we look at what's changing in society, uh, we can perhaps bring back some of that. So if we say that, you know, this is, this box is 100% of human production. You know, in the beginning, everything is non-market. And then there's a little bit coming in here in the market and then the market grows and grows and grows and grows. And this anthropologist, anthropological mode of production based on, on, on uh, reciprocity, uh, that dies out. And the first thing here is, very often the first thing is, which is traded is salt. You know, whether you're in Mexico or you're in Germany, uh, the first thing you get from the market is very often salt. And then it grows and grows and grows. But what's happening now with the new economy? Uh, this is one of the papers we're going to discuss tomorrow also. Can we define this? that actually uh, the non-market is growing again. That, that the, sh the sharing of production, actually can we s look at that as going back to reciprocity, as, as, as going away from money, labor as a commodity, and private ownership of land. You know, that's, that's a way of looking at this, which is potentially very new, uh, in, in an older setting. You know, is what we're seeing uh, also with the degrowth people, is, is what we're seeing a return to previous modes of production, which doesn't mean retrogression necessarily. It, it, it just means that, well, uh, the market uh, may shrink again. That's just, just a thought. But I, I would recommend looking at Polanyi, but because if you understand what happened when Mark... When, when the market economy took over, I think you will understand it better. Trade and markets in the early empire. This is one of Polanyi's books. And he has a great argument with Adam Smith. And Polanyi says that the division of labor became, came long before the market. You may say that's an academic dispute. But it was, uh, it was certainly an, impo an uh, important dispute. That actually early trade took part, uh, happened between tribes and not between individuals. So if we look at English and German 
and US economics. During the Industrial Revolution, the second one, in the middle of the, uh, well, but also from the first, uh, people understood that, hey, this is a kind of change that has happened before, right? And industrialism is a mode of production, even long before Marx. Industrialism is a mode of production uh, that has been preceded by others. So first you had the age of hunters, uh, then you had the age of shepherds or pasturage, age of agriculture, right? For instance, when, uh, when Columbus, when, when the Native Americans discovered Columbus, there were only two societies in Latin America who, who, uh, that had agriculture, that was Mexico and Peru, right? And um, uh, that does something to population density, which we'll get back to. But then this kind of splits up. Adam Smith establishes what he calls the age of commerce, uh, whereas, whereas uh, the German and Americans would say the age of agriculture and manufacturing. So you will find the Adam Smith uh, tradition is very much based on commerce. But there is another tradition out there, which we'll talk about today, which, which emphasizes much more production. Right? Ricardo, you know, all young economists are being, should I say, brainwashed with Ricardo's uh, theory of comparative advantage. And as a young student, you don't, perhaps don't realize how, how important it is that it is imposed on you so early on that international trade can be modeled as a barter of labor hours, right? And all labor hours are the same in Ricardo's theory, right? And, and this, is, this is a result of, of this age of commerce. So, so, you know, it doesn't matter where you have a comparative advantage. And, 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 and the Americans' reply to that would be that, well, you know, we don't want to have a comparative advantage in agriculture when everyone else has one in manufacturing. You know, you, when should I leave my comparative advantage in the Stone Age? But uh, so this difference, this emphasis here uh, on commerce uh, came to dominate economics, and especially after World War II, uh, because many of the production economists were German, and they were kind of uh, they were they were uh, how is it you say it? they were pulled out with the bathing water, in a sense, you know that. And, and, and uh, the fact that these German economists are kind of missing from today is a problem. And another problem is that American economists, until about 1950, were required to know two foreign languages, you know, fluent in either German or French or one other language. And the German economists, you could, eat, you could read them in German or in French. So these works are not, for instance, Werner Sombart's great work on modern capitalism has been translated to French and Spanish and Italian, but never to English. Right? So, so there is a gap there in the literature, and the same source of finance, uh, financing this, uh, this workshop has actually also financed uh, translations of economics books into English that have been locked in other languages. So we're getting, uh, with the help of, of, of Enet, we're getting Sombart, Werner Sombart out, 800,000 words in, in English. There is some important things here with this mode of production. And this is something that I think we to a large extent have unlearned. Hunting and gathering societies, you know, if you are in the Amazon making a living by hunting and gathering, two persons per square kilometer is, is, is a lot. Right? If you have an agricultural society, say in Eritrea, when you reach 40 persons per square kilometers, you, 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 you're pretty densely populated. And you will see that, well, I tend to get invited to the countries with most problems. So I get invited to places like Eritrea and Zimbabwe. Uh, and and, and uh, uh, it was pretty obvious in Eritrea that the problem started uh, when the population density approached 50. Right, so then people, then people leave. And where do they go to? Well, they go to industrial societies like Holland with 400 people, 400 persons per square kilometer. 
Right? So this is, this is a thing that I think was much better understood earlier. We'll come back to that. This was the basis of the Marshall Plan. You know, why we needed to reindustrialize Germany was based on this, on, on this kind of understanding. And, and in, in a sense, it's either move economic activities or move people. Now we are in a, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a modus where we are moving people, but there used to be an alternative. So when we look back in history, we find that the idea is that uh, large manufacturing sectors are able to feed a large population. And you also find in England in the 1650s people saying, hey, there are only famines in countries which are specialized in agriculture. Where, where, you know, <laughs> where they plow the sea, they would say poetically. Nations plowing the sea don't have famines. But <laughs> nations plowing the soil have, 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 have famines. So if we get to our, our uh, main subject of what we're doing here. In 1277, a gentleman by the name of Roger Bacon was arrested in Oxford for suspicious innovations. Right? Innovations was heresy. That was like going, it was going outside the Bible and Aristotle in order to search, new, to find new knowledge. Right? And then another Bacon in 1605 in, in Cambridge, <laughs> uh, Francis Bacon writes an essay on innovations. And innovation become the essence of progress. So something happened here. Something very radical happened. And that was the Renaissance, right? And the Renaissance, to put it very shortly, was, in, was you know, Florence, Italian city-states. But it was influenced by philosophers who came from Constantinople. Uh, one of them who brought Plato back is usually called Platon. And Platon said, well, you guys have read the Bible wrong. It says we are created in the image of God. What does that mean? Well, that means we have to try to emulate God. We have to be, try to be a bit godlike. And what is the essence of God? Of course, it's the creation. Six days of creation and then resting on the seventh day. So in, in a sense, this duty to invent, as I call it, uh, happened here somewhere. And, and, and the birth of capitalism, uh, if you use Sombart's definition, what, re, what does capitalism require? Well, according to him, it requires two things. Double entry bookkeeping, so you can actually calculate how much capital you have. You know, if you, before double entry bookkeeping, you couldn't, you, 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 couldn't, uh, you, you couldn't calculate that. And it requires bankruptcy, those two things. And if you, if, you, if you say, where do these two things show up? Well, they show up in Venice around 1200. Uh, and, and the bankrupts, you know, the, the, there's a small uh, square on the, if you go from St. Mark to across towards the station, across, uh, across Rialto, there's a small square to the right, and that's where the bankers, that's where capitalism started in a way. Uh, and and uh, the government took care of the money at night, but these bankers were sitting around with their, on their benches, right, on their desks. Ba banque. And um, if some of them didn't pay, well, the disgruntled customers would take an axe and smash it. Banca erota. A smashed desk. That was, that was the institution of, of bankruptcy, right? So um, uh, these Italian city-states are, 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 are different. Seemingly the, the, the people in Genoa were the ones with the most advanced banking system. So they competed. And I think this is also one of the very, one of the insights from Sombat, that what made capitalism work was this continuous uh, rivalry between these small states, right? And, and, and there were rivalry not only in war, but also in luxury, right? So somebody wrote one book called War and Capitalism. In the end of War and Capitalism, the last phrase is where he says that 
the lack of natural rubber uh, created uh, was part of that uh, the creative destruction of war. So that's where Schumpeter got the creative destruction from, from Sombart's book on war. Um, and then he wrote another book on um, uh, luxury and capitalism. So uh, it's out of Italy, but in English you, 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 you see it clearly here with, with, uh, with, 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 with Bacon. Bacon has a point on degenerate learning. Surely as many substances in nature which are solid do putrefy and corrupt into worms, so is the propriety of good and solid knowledge to putrefy into a number of subtle, idle and unwholesome questions with no soundness or goodness of quality. Uh, the de degenerate learning of the schoolmen, knowing little history, did with no great quantity of matter spin us unto laborious cobwebs of learning that are admirable for their fineness of thread and work, but of no substance or profit. Well, if you ask me, that's neoclassical economics as it's at, at, at its worst, right? So, so it was the, the Renaissance was also um, throwing out an old way of thinking, and 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 what was thrown out was Aristotle, and who was in was 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 Plato, and 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 uh, actually testing things by experience. You know, Bacon died on a rare day of snow in London. He died from pneumonia because he thought when the snow came, he, he, could, he could test if, uh, if you chill things, if they would keep better. So his plan was to fill uh, slaughtered chickens with snow to test if they, if, if they actually uh, kept better. Right? But unfortunately, he died from pneumonia in, in, <laughs> in, in, in the process. But you know, that, that was the spirit, right? That spirit of learning and innovation which came comes out of, uh, out, out of this thinking. But the main, uh, the main person who, who uh, starts economics, I think he, Giovanni Botero, uh, is actually the father both of, of um, mercantilism and cameralism. Uh, if any of you are around in northern Italy on the 8th of October, the little town of Bene Vagena, where he was born, is celebrating the 400th anniversary of him passing away. Um, Botero was a Jesuit who refused to do missionary work among, um, uh, among the Protestants. So as a punishment, they sent him to Rome to be in charge of the list of prohibited books. Right. So he was sitting in Rome, <laughs> reading all the books, that, uh, being the censor of all the books, and also the books that were prohibited, of course, he could, he, he, he could take from them. And this was the age of great discoveries. And uh, Botero has, has uh, two books. Uh, sorry for the bad, bad scan. Uh, the Reason of State, with three books on the causes of the greatness and magnificence of cities. Right. So, 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 so the question was, why is it that on the continent of Europe, only some few islands of some few cities are rich, you know, be they Florence or, or, or Venice or Amsterdam. And the question was also, well, all the gold that flowed into Spain from, from Mexico and Peru and Bolivia, uh, that they ended up in Venice and Amsterdam. You know, the, what, what is it about these cities that attract uh, so much uh, wealth. So this was published in, 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 in 1589. And it was a tremendous bestseller. Uh, I'm going to go through here briefly. Uh, you will find a paper, I did a paper with, with my wife who is a librarian and uh, a librarian at Harvard. We found the we took all the economics books that were published in more than 10 editions before 1850. And I can tell you that, that that's a puzzle. That's a puzzle. And we probably still, probably still miss some, but, 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 uh, but I think we, we, we've got most of them by now. 
And the first ones, I mean, look, we're looking at printed books, okay? So the first ones are in Aristotle and Xenophon. Then comes the first one, which is born as a book, uh, which is Luther's book on uh, trade and usury. Uh, you know, if you, if, you read, if, you, if you read that book, L Luther's on usury, and think of Mario Draghi, you know, it, 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 there's something in there with, with, with idle money, which is, which is, which is, uh, which is qu uh, quite interesting. Then it's Xenophon again, and then you have Botero, a tract against usury in England, Francis Bacon and his innovation, Bernardo da Manzati, who uh, held a speech in Florence in 1588. It was published in in 1638, a lot of editions. And then the first German, uh, the, the uh, librarian of, in the library of Gotha, uh, Ludwig von Seckendorf, the German uh, uh, principality of the German state. And then you have the first Dutch one uh, on, on the interest of Holland. So Botero starts economics and his explanation is essentially that wealth is concentrated in the cities because only there you find a large number of different economic activities with innovations that add value to the raw materials of nature. So, so uh, Botero was there. well here is a block of marble and here is Michelangelo's La Pieta. Here is a heap of logs and here is a house. So, so it, in a sense, it was his, his logic was value added. You know, the further you were away from raw materials, the, the, the more was the value added. And I have to say, in the 70s, when I worked in, in Switzerland, I was sent out to, to two missions in Latin America in 70, 1972 and 74 uh, with UNCTAD. Uh, that's when I started distrusting experts. If I, at the age of 23, was an expert, I, you know, I knew that experts were only people who were far away from home, so I, I never trusted them again. Uh, but then the message was, in a way, this. It was add value. You know, Ecuador should stop producing bananas only. They should make banana chips and they should make baby food out of bananas. So development economics, as it was in the early 70s, adding value, was, you know, very much in the spirit of, of Botero, although nobody really... Uh, looked at it from that point of view. And, you know, Botero and the people of that generation, would, it's almost as if they said, if you want to know the wealth of a city, go into the city and count the number of professions. The larger the number of professions, the richer the city. And if you do that in, on Manhattan and in Kampala, you know, it's, it's, it still probably works, right? So, and this is, you know, the idea of synergies and clusters and all that was, was, was born. And here are the additions of, of, of Botero, the, 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 the first one. You see, they're, they're, they're very frequent. Um, there is, uh, here are the first translations in, in Germany. But in Germany, it was so early that he was translated into Latin. He wrote in vernacular, he wrote in Italian. But in Germany, it was translated into Latin. And this is Strasbourg. I should have spelt it in Strasbourg, because this was when it was still German. And then you have, you have the French translation there and the Spanish translation there. Uh, and uh, a couple of English translations. So, the, you know, he's, um, he's translated, you know, these are many more translations in the first hundred years than Adam Smith had. And this is a period, and this was a thick book. Not all issues were, 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 were equally voluminous, uh, but books were, were, such, were so much more expensive. So, so um, this, was really, this was really amazing. You know, I found, I'd seen Botero as one of many economists, but when I came to Gotha, uh, where um, after the Thirty Years' War, uh, the ruler was, was Ernst der Fromme, or Ernest the Pious, who was a, an important ruler. He hired a young liber librarian called Seckendorf, and I found more than 30 editions of Botero's works before, 18, before 1665 in the Gotha Library. 
the Gotha Library had not been catalogued. And since, since it hadn't been catalogued, you know, the East German regime didn't, didn't uh, expropriate the books and take them away. So the library was saved because of that. But this is an enormous, uh, an enormous distribution, explosive. His other book um, was, on geo was on ethnography and geography, Relazioni Universali. That has even more editions. I thought I had an early edition in, in, in Venice, 1620, and it's the 42nd edition. I mean, this is mind-boggling how, how this uh, book spread. But people didn't refer to him. But if you go, if you look at Sir Walter Raleigh, the, uh, the, the Englishman, his economic theory is pure Botero. If you, if you look at the first economics books in, in Sweden by Anders Berg, the first uh, economist, the first chair of economics outside Germany uh, in, in, the six, in the 1740s in Uppsala, you know, he says, as we all know, the real gold mines are not the gold mines, but manufacturing. And you read that and say, well, as we all know, where, where does he get that from? And he gets it from Botero. Or uh, uh, some other. Uh, uh, Campanella is another alternative who says the same thing a, bit, a few years after Botero. And I checked in Uppsala, you know, was Botero around? And I got confirmed that there were at least four copies of, of this book around Uppsala in, 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 in 1700. Right? So ideas spread a lot in Europe. You know, uh, Botero's first book was published in Würzburg. Uh, a second book was published in France. So, so this was, you know, pan, this was a pan-European thing. But we don't realize it because we, 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 don't, uh, we, we, we don't see him quoted. There were two Englishmen in the 1622s, 23, um, Misselden and Malines. And Misselden you know, says to Malines, you're an idiot. You don't see the difference between a, a pile of logs and a house. And, well, where does that come from? And you know, 20 years later, you read Botero and say, oh, that's where it came from. Right? So it was very influential. But innovation was, at that point, kind of adding value. And then you have uh, an even more interesting economist, Antonio Serra, uh, a brief treatise on the causes which may make uh, the kingdoms abound with gold and silver. Where also where there are no mines. This is the trick again. Where, why on earth does the gold and silver end up where there are no mines? Right. This and, and uh, Serra, uh, not very famous. He wrote in a jail in Naples and died in the jail in Naples. There are about five copies known of his book, but he was rediscovered around 1750, and 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 it was it, it was understood why he was uh, such an important economist. A little group of us, we have, have an Antonio Serra fan club, uh, you know, less than people in the room here. So we put up a mo memorial plaque on the jail where he died in 1613. Uh, so Serra's two key dichotomies was the financial economy versus the production economy. And that wasn't new. You find that in the Bible already. The idea of mammon as being capital, which is unproductive, right? Uh, but he re-emphasized that. And then the big thing, increasing returns versus diminishing returns. Schumpeter says that Serra was the first to write a scientific treatise in economics. So Schumpeter sees his, 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 his brilliance. And... Um, Increasing returns has kind of been there, as some said, like, like an underground river, kind of popping up occasionally. But uh, increasing returns means, of course, that as you increase your volume of production, your costs go down. And you know, this is the difference between a house painter and Bill Gates. If a house painter here, if you ask him for a price to paint one house, and you say, well, how much of a discount do you give me if you paint the second house, which is exactly the same size? Well, he won't give you any discount because it takes just as long time, right? Bill Gates is different. You know, uh, the new 
programs, you know, Windows 17 or whatever you want to call it, costs $500 million. Copy number two costs 10 cents. You know, it's very difficult to compete with people with that kind of cost structure. The problem is that in the 1930s, increasing returns was kicked out of economics because it was not compatible with equilibrium. Instead, they should have kicked out equilibrium because it was not compatible with increasing returns. Right? And the problem, if you leave increasing returns out, you, you, you create an economics which is a harmony layer, uh, uh, which, 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 which what, how an English economist called it. You create a system of automatic harmony, right? With no frictions, everything is equal, uh, and this is a big, this is a series of big problem. You know, if you are at Harvard Business School, well, you are, uh, you know that in order to make money, you have to raise the barriers to entry, and a very important way of raising barriers to entry is, is, is exploiting increasing, in, increasing returns. So this is crucial. And Schumpeter has an important term, historical increasing returns. Historical increasing returns, uh, he says, is a mixture of technological change and increasing returns. Because you very often don't get the old technology at a new scale. So if you compare Henry Ford's uh, car factory with the car factory that was before Henry Ford, you see a big productivity increase, but you don't know how much of that productivity increase is due to scale and how much is due to te technological change. Right? So I think this is important, that, that part of innovation, what you measure as, as innovation, is clearly scale. Right? But, but difficult to distinguish. That's why I think his term, that, that's never used, but Schumpeter, um, uses it, and I think it's useful, uh, historical increasing returns. So, for instance, if we're, if we're talking about energy, you have the difference between manufacturing versus extraction of energy. You know, if, if, if uh, solar panels manufacture energy to, under increasing returns, where, but oil and coal extract energy under diminishing returns. So, so, so in a sense between, uh, well, if you have diminishing returns, you get the dismal signs of Ricardo. If you have increasing returns, you know, you, you can get, you can argue that there are also some glimmers of hope there. So this is the, this, the, we won't talk too much about the financial sector, but this is the, this is, I think, what I saw on the board in St. Gallen in 1970. Uh, the real economy, what Schuppert called the Güterwelt, the, the world of goods and services, and the financial economy, which Schumpeter called the Rechenfennige, or the, shall we say, accounting units. You know, if you, you de demystify money a bit by calling them accounting units. So here in Keynes, bridge in time, you, 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 you need to finance a factory or a house, and you go to the financial sector, and you get what you need for the next 40 years, and you pay interest. Then, in certain periods of time, uh, it gets boring for the, for, for the financial market to still, to, you know, to, to loan out money and wait, so they make their own bubbles, right? So one of the books, one of, one, after the crisis in, in 2008 was Make Banking Boring Again, right? Because, because you, you uh, here, banking is, a, is an excellent servant, but, but, but when it starts making money inside the, inside the financial sector without affecting the real economy, it's a problem. Or it's even worse when, like now, uh, the financial sector says, well, Greece, give us 20% of your GDP. So, so, so it's actually, the, the financial sector becomes a parasite, right? And this is in the old, uh, in the old theories, you, you, you can find, you, you, you can find this. Uh, very old statement of this. Uh, Theodoric, king of Italy, uh, um, this consideration of money made him order the gold and silver deposited according to pagan customs in the tombs to be removed and used for coining for the public profit, saying it was a crime to leave hidden among the dead and useless what, could, what would keep the living alive. This is a kind of reasoning you also have with Luther, that, that, that actually what the, what the Catholic Church was doing in Germany, they were, they were 
taking money out of Germany and using it for, uh, for silly things in Rome. So they, they were actually hoarding, right? And, and this idea that money is to help the living, this is also very much Luther. So, so it's, it's, it's Catholic and Lutheran at the same time. Uh, but, and this is Oresme, uh, another guy we're looking for for the bestsellers, uh, in 1355. So diminishing returns, just, to, just to, 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 to give you an example of that for practical reasons. Uh, I did my PhD thesis uh, checking Antonio Serra's theory. Right? I, 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 had, I had a lot of time, so I went into the library and I took the oldest economic books I could find. And that was Serra from 1613. And you know, with my background from Peru, my background as a businessman, I thought, well, this book actually makes sense. So, I went to Latin America and I tried to see if he was right by looking at what happened to costs when production rose in tin production in Bolivia, banana production in Ecuador, and cotton production in Peru. And in all cases, Serra was right. The, the more successful they were in producing, the higher were their costs. So actually, uh, Serra was, was right, even you know, 400 years later. So this is, the, uh, this is banana industry in Ecuador. In the 60s, there was a disease, what was it called, Sagatoga disease, I think, on bananas in, in Central America. So it was a fantastic opportunity for Ecuador to take over the North American market. And you see, they, they doubled the area cultivated uh, in, for bananas, and the average yield per hectare is cut by 50%. So, so the average yield is a mirror image of the area cultivated. Well, this wouldn't really surprise an agricultural economist, but, but that this is so important for development is, is, is not really recognized. And then they say, well, we're in the wrong business. They, go, they, they start producing soya again, and, and, and you know, yield gets up, goes up. And here you say it's a technological change here. When they are at the same level, they're slightly more productive here, but, but this this innovation change is completely dwarfed by the diminishing returns. And in Bolivia, yes? Uh, but how are you controlling for prices? Because it also could have affected uh, like, their less uh, yield and they could have been controlled for uh, I think this, uh, that, that, that's absolutely a valid point. Uh, but uh, this market was pretty much under control by United Fruit. Or, or Mamita Yunai, as they call the company in, in Central America. And, and they pretty much control the market. So, so uh, you, you, would, you, would, you would expect that. I, I, I agree with you. But, but uh, um, uh, here, clearly, they were, making, they, they were making less money, but that's why they decided to go out of it. Actually, if you look at it, there is only one province in, in, um, in Ecuador, Provincia del Oro, which is really good for bananas. right? Uh, and as long as you go outside there, well, uh, costs go down. And uh, uh, the, yields, the, the yields go down. No, in a perfect market, that would be solved. Uh, but uh, the, the, the problem is that, that uh, there, is, there is also a market power in there. By the way, Ecuador is where United Fruit decided to innovate. They found out that growing bananas was not so much... Uh, they didn't need to have the backward integration they had in, in Central America, so they started buying bananas from, from, um, from independent, uh, I independent uh, suppliers whom they could squeeze, of course. So if we take Serra's diminishing returns, we get the limits to growth. If we take increasing returns, you get a critique of the limits of growth, uh, which were published a year after by, by Chris Freeman, was the main author in Sussex, um, who actually is, is essentially said, you know, Malthus in, Malthus out. Right? If, if you have models with diminishing returns, you, 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 you get this. If you have models with increasing returns, you can actually be optimistic. And I think this is what we have to balance. You know, in what areas can we actually, with our knowledge of innovation and technology, where can we expect um, innovations that, uh, that actually solve our problems, and where can't we? You know, I would say in, in, in energy we probably can. 
in, in gold mining, there will probably still be, um, there will probably still be uh, four tons of, of slightly toxic waste for every golden ring, right? So, so with our diminishing returns, I think the, the, limits to, uh, the limits to growth people were right. But the problem was, in a way, that limits to growth became limits to innovations, right? And, and then, you have, then you have to see, well, where is it that innovations can solve the problems and where, what, where isn't it? So this is, this is uh, the other book I was talking about, um, the, 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 the German uh, Principality, uh, 13 editions. And this was a book that was actually in print in Germany for over 100 years. Um, and um, second of went with, with Ernest the Pious, his ruler, to Holland. And that's where he, after having been in Holland, he, 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 uh, he added an ganz neue Zugabe. That's what he wrote after having been in Holland. And, and, and because Holland was the country to emulate. Right? Holland was the country at that time which was the richest. So, so the game, if there is one important word, I think, to, 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 to take away, is emulation. Right? Emulation means copying someone with the intent of improving. So all sport is about emulation. You know, who can run the fastest? Who can throw the discus the furthest? And the, the name of the game for small European countries or big European countries was emulation, copying the leader. And the early economics books were about copying Holland, then the later economics books is about, is about copying England. And, and this is a book about copying Holland. To the extent that they said, what does Holland have that we don't have? Canals. We have to start building canals in Germany. So, so maybe they, the reason, you know, the, the, obviously canals were very efficient, uh, means of, of, of uh, um, or, or communication, but it didn't mean that you should start dig canals in Germany, which is partly what they, what, what, what they tried. Then, an interesting book, um, which was published the year after, very early in the year after the, the siege of Vienna, Austria above all, if she only wants to, 1684, very clearly, a strategy of uh, improving agriculture and improving uh, manufacturing by including new industries. So innovation was often in new industries. And the, interestingly, in German, they used the same word, to plant. They, they planted industries and they planted plants. Right? So, so bringing in new innovation was like planting new species. 100 years later, uh, the, the 100th anniversary of, of this book, which has been in print all the time, says actually, look at how rich Austria is now because we follow the advice of Mr. Honeck. So it's an, it's, it, it is really a fascinating book, which again, thanks to Enet, will have out in English in a couple of months. It's the first time translated into English. And, and it's, uh, um, I think, a very useful book. So if we look at uh, some, some other bestsellers here, um, this is numbers 21 to 31. Um, you see there, Mandeville, The Fable of the Beasts, which is a very interesting book, which we kind of draws the line for good and bad greed, which, which was very important. You know, private interest, as long as it is in the public interest, is always good for society. But since we don't have in economics any longer, we, we, we don't have society, we don't have the, the, the common good, you know, uh, we, we have a problem differentiating that. But, but clearly, uh, uh, Mandeville is, is, is useful and, and, and uh, in, in many ways very wise. Here's the first Spanish um, bestseller. You see the, the Justi, who, who, who was a master in self plagiarizing and wrote, uh, you know, 15 books on the same subject. Then in, in Italian, uh, uh, you, the idea of hap happiness, glückseligkeit in Germany, 
is translated into Italian to public happiness. Right? Felicità pubblica. Um, and here is a papal uh, economist. But I want you to, to point you to um, Joshua G. The Trade and Navigation of Great Britain Considered, London 1729. This is the stuff that the English were writing before Adam Smith. And interestingly, of all these 80 authors, there are only two which don't even have a Wikipedia entry. So if you don't have a Wikipedia entry today, you know you're nobody, right? <laughs> Especially not if you were a best-selling economist. So it's, it's, it is interesting. It's always, of course, it, I'm not saying this is, uh, this is not a conspiracy. I'm just saying that, that, that uh, you know, those who win the war write the books. <laughs> And, and, and England was, you know, they were, they were not keen on showing uh, what Joshua G. had said. So G. is saying, well, he's talking about Negroes, but don't worry about that. They did the same thing to the Irish, okay? So it's, it's, it's not racist. <laughs> uh, that all Negroes shall be prohibited from weaving either linen or woolen or spinning or combing on wool or work at any manufacture of iron further than making it into pig or buyer iron that they shall also be prohibited from manufacturing of hats, stockings, or leather of any kind. Indeed, if they set up manufacturers and the government afterwards shall be under a necessity of stopping their progress, we must not expect that it will be done with the same ease that now it may. You know, this is technology policy. This is innovation policy. You know, you colonies are not allowed to produce anything where there is innovation. So the, the key thing in Colonial policy was the prohibition of manufacturers. The United States were allowed to produce tar and mass timber for masts, but they were not allowed to do ma manufacturing. This is a, an important reason behind uh, 1776. So there were at least 20 editions of G's work. In, you see they published in London, but also in Scotland and in Dublin, because these were the poor periphery who wanted to see what, what, what the colonial master did to them. French translation published in London, Amsterdam and Geneva, Dutch, Spanish, and German in Copenhagen. So this was a book which was all over the place, which nobody has heard of. But this is innovation policy. This is what colonialism is all about. Right? Uh, and, and I think that, 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 that is important. And it was conscious. It, 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 it was very conscious and very honest. This is a time where, where, where economists were, where, where were still honest. <laughs> they were not pretending that, oh, by free trade, everybody will get uh, equally rich, etc., etc., although it was not true. So, um, no hypocrisy. Right? And that's, that, 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 that's, what I, that's what I like about it. So, um, if, we, if we look at economics, um, I think there are two, two types. And I think something very important happened with economics uh, after the fall of the Berlin Wall. You know, uh, we've had a healthy emulation between the communist societies and the West for a long time. You know, communism was an awful system. I'm not saying that. I'm, I'm saying that communism for the West was a credible threat. So. And that credible threat of communism actually shaped the West. So, you know, what came, comes out of, 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 of the fall of the Berlin Wall is this arrogance, you know. One of the nice things about economics is that it's only a way of thinking. Factual knowledge does not exist. This is Friedman, 1953, really. So, so what is this saying? Well, don't disturb us with facts, right? And he... He could say this, and this was, oh, you know, the wise men, et cetera, et cetera, uh, would, would uh, this would be, um, people would look up to a statement like that. And then I think the other, the other uh, type of economics is by the German uh, philosopher uh, Gadamer. The root of everything we can call theory is to observe things as they are. Right? And I'm there. And I think too much of economics has been there. And, 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 and I don't think you can be, I think you have to make a decision. Uh, Samuelson, uh, in a way, says, well, on, on Monday, Thursday, and, and, and Friday, I can work in economics with one set of assumptions, and on Tuesdays and Thursdays, I can work with another set of assumptions. Well, I, I'm afraid, you know, then you're going to 
tailor what you're doing to the demand. Right? And, and I think demand, the role of demand in economics has been totally underestimated. You know, when, when I'd finished my, uh, my thesis at, at, at Cornell, um, with, with uh, uh, one development econ economist and a trade economist, Jaroslav Vanyek, who, who was, wrote the uh, Heckscherolin Vanyek theorem, well, they said, as the Americans say, well, there are good news and bad news. You know, the good news is that this is an excellent thesis. Um, uh, it was called International Trade and the Economic Mechanisms of Under Development. Um, looking at, looking at, it was set uh, And the bad, but the bad news is that you will never get a job at the university, right? Because there is no demand for what, you, what you're writing. Nobody wants to read that, right? And they say, well, you know, we don't pity you. You have an MBA from Harvard, you would survive. But <laughs> this is the demand factor. And, 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 and this, I think, is what, what, uh, what, what, what the crisis should bring forward. And, and what I see is what, what, what really pleases me is, is uh, a new generation which is not so, you know, new people who are not so stuck in the right-left axis. You know, I think this is, this is very, very healthy. So, so, so I think uh, I'm, I'm hopeful for, for the next uh, generations because this could clearly be ideology. And, and of course, you know, if you make economics into a no-friction system, with automatic harmony, well, that's an argument uh, for, for the market, obviously. So, so, so there is an ideological twist to what assumptions you, you make, right? And the, the problem was that, you know, using equilibrium as, as a metaphor produced, uh, produced uh, arguments against uh, the planned economy, which, which, which were good. So I'm, I'm looking at, briefly here before we take the break, first place I was teaching was Hobart and William Smith Colleges in upstate New York. And we were using, as everyone was using at the time, Samuelson, uh, 1976. You know, that Samuelson's Economics was a textbook for a couple of generations. And he was, I'm sorry it's not easy to read, but here's a family tree of economics, Bible, Aristotle, um, Kene, Adam Smith, David Ricardo, and then it splits up. Karl Marx, Lenin, USSR, China, and New Left, David Ricardo, John Stuart Mill, Valra, Marshall, Keynes, and post-Keynes in mainstream economics. So what, what I thought was, was fascinating with this was that um, the Cold War, which was really on at the time, was really a civil war between two fractions of Ricardian economics. I thought that was fascinating. Right? So, so you have Ricardians to the right and Ricardians to the left, and they are at war with, with each other. So, so I thought, well, there must be somebody who didn't agree with Ricardo. <laughs> you know, where, where are all the non-Ricardians? And I started looking at the non-Ricardians and, 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 and built my own, uh, my own family tree, uh, which, is, which is, well, out of the Renaissance, there is a, an English branch, starts with, in 1485, Botero, Serra, there is a French, uh, branch here with Colbert and Lafama, uh, von Honig, uh, Honig in Germany, and and you know you, you can, Friedrich List was very very important, in most countries in Europe, and you have Hamilton who has read his Adam Smith, but he goes back into Malachi Postlethwaite, which is an English mercantilist. That's where he get his ideas from, although he had read Adam Smith. Daniel Raymond, very important economist, inspires List. Pershine Smith was a U.S. economist who was uh, the first one who was employed by the Japanese government, and he takes the U.S. manufacturing system to Japan. You have Carey in the U.S. Uh, century. You have, out of the German historical school, you have Veblen. You have Schumpeter to the right and Marx to the left, but you also have these guys, Schmoller and Sombart, who are unfortunately forgotten, who, who, who were kind of in, 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 in the political middle. And classical development economist, uh, Chris Freeman says that the inventor of the national innovation system was Friedrich List. And I think he's right. You know, this, this is uh, not high theory, but, but very sensible recommendations. And you can make different family trees here. If you, if you look at Portugal, you would find that um, a, a Portuguese uh, ambassador to France in, in the 1700s, a guy called Duarte uh, says, well, we have, to, we have to industrialize, we have to 
to, to uh, copy Colbert, and it was well received. This was a time when the Brazil, Portuguese government was in Brazil. Uh, and then they find gold in Minas Gerais, and industri industrialization plants disappear. Right. Uh, then again in Brazil, uh, it's being picked up in the 1820s by a certain Barão de Mauá, who, who, who pushes industrialization again. And so, you know, these industrialization movements are all, all there. You can, put, you can put all countries, in a sense, into this, into this map. And, and uh, uh, I think it's fair to say that no economic, uh, no nations has ever grown rich without the period of, of protecting where innovation was. Remember that innovation until the 20th century was mainly outside, was mainly in the manufacturing sector. There was relatively little innovation in agriculture. And we come to agriculture afterwards. But, but you know, this is, this is the alternative, alternative family tree to, 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 uh, uh, to, to Samuelson. Um, well, I think we should have a break. And if you have any questions before the break, I was going to talk about something else after the break, but if you have some questions... Yes? Yes, I have a question about um, Adam Smith and manufacturing. Uh, and from what it seems that he wasn't very focused on manufacturing, it was, was also in commerce, but at the same time his pin factory was, was his way of illustrating how nations become wealthy. So could you explain uh, the connection between what Adam yep. Smith thought about manufacturing. Well, Adam Smith's first book, The Theory of Moral Sentiments, he is a mercantilist in many ways. Um, and he says, when we support new industries, new clothing industries, it's not to help the consumer. And it's even less to help the producer, it is to help the great system of government. So Adam Smith, 1759, the great system of government. Then he goes to Paris and he meets the physiocrats and, and, and is influenced by them. And the physiocrats were all for agriculture and then Adam Smith in a way comes out halfway. Uh, and by now, England has, by 1776, England is clearly the leader. And they don't need protection anymore. Right? So this transition from protection to free trade, it's, it's a very interesting one. The American one was perfect, late 19th century. They, 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 because, you know, you, you have vested interest and you can stay on for too long. But Adam Smith, uh, uh, if you read what he says, he says, the wisest laws that were ever passed were the Navigation Act, protecting English shipping, etc., etc. And then the only time he mentions the invisible hand in the wealth of nations it is about four pages later, and he says, it is as if an invisible hand leads English consumers to buy English goods. So what the invisible hand had produced was import substitution, right? But, but we read Adam Smith too little, <laughs> and, and I think we, we, think, um, we, we think we know what he says, but, but uh, he's, he's different. And he has this argument that about the, the physiocrats had uh, be, had exaggerated for agriculture, and he says, if you have a tree which is, is bent the, one way, in order to get it straight, you have to bend it the other way. So, so, so the, the past had been too much pro-manufacturing, pro and the physiocrats too, mu too, 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 too much on the other side, and you, you had to try to get the tree straight. But clearly, Adam Smith is changing his mind. And Patrick O'Brien, who is probably the greatest economic historian in, in England, is now 85. I met him two weeks ago in Budapest at a conference. He always says that Adam Smith is really a misunderstood mercantilist, if, 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 if you read him. And by the way, the, the, uh, 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 the pin factory is taken from a German economist who wrote in France in 1622-23, uh, Karl uh, Ludwig Karl, uh, call, uh, Karl from Brandenburg, he has that example in, 16, in, the, 16, 20, in, in the 1720s. 
so, so, so the, the, the pin factory, which is a great example, is, 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 not, really, is not really Adam Smith. But Adam Smith was, a, was, you know, was a great philosopher, but, but as um, I think it was Lionel Roberts, who, who this, the English economist in the 1950s and 60s, who said that we must remember that English eco economists were first Englishmen and then they were economists. And I think that applies not only to the English, it, it applies to all of them. There was an undertone of nationalism there. And that's why these translations are so strange, because they translate... Uh, Carey, John Carey was an Englishman who was very against the Pope, etc., etc., he writes a book, and this book is translated into Italian, and it's three times as thick, and it's a book in favour of the Pope, but in favour of the same principles of manufacturing. So translations were often um, interesting things because they took the, principle, the principles from one context and said, well, if we apply these principles in another context, how does it look? Right? So it was an, a, a wide term of translation. My son, uh, actually, uh, who, who's a, who didn't follow his father's advice, so he's a professor at Harvard Business School, he, he has written a book on this called Translating Empire. And, 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 and it's actually the story of translating how translations were, 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 were made from one context uh, to another. But um, uh, Karl Knies, who was a German economist around uh, 1850, wrote a book on Das Adam Smith Problem. <laughs> right? And Das Adam Smith Problem was kind of the changing of his mind around the time he met with the, with the physiocrats. So, so, but, but if you read him, he's, he's a humanist in, in many ways. You know, he's, uh, he's, 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 not an evil, uh, he's not an evil guy by, by any means. So, okay. I'm just worried, there's one slide, I think it's possible that you mixed them up with Adam Smith. It was in the beginning about pasturage. I think Adam Smith was talking about pasturage because that's, I checked out all the sources going, is he wasn't talking about shepherd. Can just go back to his slides. I think you mix the two sides up as possible. Oh, with, with, if I told him. Yeah, the German side, they, they might have talked about the others, but it's not the uh, Oh, okay, well, that's possible. It's pretty much in the beginning, I think it's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, no, it, if it was the past bridge or. Otherwise, I'm talking to you. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think that's probably. <laughs> that may very well have been. That may very well have been, been the case. That must be. Past bridge and shepherd. It should be opposite, right? Yeah. It's, yeah, okay. Thank you. Uh, but it's interesting here, you know, while we're back to this, uh, these German economists and US economists very much agreed on, uh, in the relationship to English economists. So, so uh, the United States, in the United States, um, uh, economic, graduate e education in economics came very late. So all the founders of the American Economic Association, with the exception of one, had actually studied in Germany, right? So, so there is, the, 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 there is this transport of ideas between the latecomers, right? And then Japan enters the pictures, the picture, and and um, the only economists that, who are employed in Japan are uh, American economists or German economists. There are no English economists, right? And the and the Japanese translate uh, not the principle of, of of economics from Marshall, they translate Marshall's book on industry and trade, which is much more pragmatic, right? So, so there is, um, the way ideas travel is, is, uh, is, is quite interesting. You see that the, the, the countries at the same level of development kind of learn from each other uh, against the leader, right? And the leader at the time was, was England. Okay, we'll, um, We'll have a uh, we'll have a, a coffee break, and Olga, you're the boss. When should we be back? Ten minutes. Oh yes, yes, yes. Okay. Um, should you be interested in these stories of Botero and the early Germans or whatever? Um, this is a book which we published last fall: Handbook of Alternative Theories of Economic Development. It's one and a half kilos of book, uh, 40 chapters, trying to take uh, a less Eurocentric view of the world 
including chapters on Muslim economics to chapters on Chinese economics. Um, so, so it's, it's a, a very wide um, uh, set of theories which are, which are uh, collected here. And you'll find it, of course, in the library here. And, and next year we'll have a, a, a paperback which is less expensive because this is, this is horrendously expensive, unfortunately. So, from the first uh, hour, think of the word, word emulation as a kind of a substitute for, information, for, for innovation. So, so if we say we, want to em we have to emulate Holland, that was we have to try to make our ex economic structure as the Dutch structure is, right? We want to, later, we want to try to emulate England, is that was emulating the economic structure. Economic structure is, 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 is important, and, and, and think of that, put it in the same category, I think, as innovation, because you won't find the word innovation uh, as clearly as you do in Bacon. I mean, Bacon is crystal clear on it, but not everyone. So, uh, you know, we've, the Cold War has marked, you know, my, most of my life, uh, and we, we, we tend to think of, of uh, the Cold War being between two very different systems, and of, and of course they were very different systems. Uh, but Carlota Perez, who will be coming here later this afternoon, is making, has made the point about the isomorphism between Western capitalism and, and, um, uh, uh, and communism. And uh, because they both were following what we could call, that's my word, the cult of industry, the cult of manufacturing. You know, Stalin was steel and electricity. And uh, this is a stamp from West Germany, and this is a stamp from East Germany. And these people did not have many people, uh, many heroes in common. Probably the only hero they had in common was Friedrich List. Right? And, and, and here he is pictured with with, with the train, he was infrastructure and industrialization. And, and this stamp is also issued for, uh, because of railroads. So they, they even take the same portrait. Uh, and I think this, this is significant. And what, what happened with the fall of the Berlin Wall was that this kind of cult of industry disappeared. And you can see that very clearly in the policies of the EU. When Spain was integrated into the EU in the 1980s, it was paying a lot of attention, of attention to the economic structure. A lot of investment was made to save and improve the Spanish car manufacturing industry. It was a kind of the paradigm carrier of, of, of the time. And it, and, and tariffs were gradually reduced over 10 years. Everything was done to keep, in the spirit of Friedrich List, to keep manufacturing alive in Spain. Then comes 1989 and the fall of the Berlin Wall. Then comes uh, Maastricht. And this policy kind of disappears. Then comes 2004, uh, when, the, when, when, uh, uh, when there is an extension of the EU to the former Soviet bloc, including Estonia, May 1st, 2004, and the idea that economic structure matters is gone. Right? So you have varying degrees of decentralization, of, of deindustrialization. Right? You have, um, and, and the problem was that this shock therapy, as it was called at the time, um, was pretty destructive. I mean, it was to a degree that before these com the industrial companies in Eastern, in, in the former Soviet bloc, before they had a cost accounting put in place, they were bankrupt. So, so it, it, it was a massive destruction. And uh, uh, Latvia, the neighboring country here, has seen population uh, has seen more than 20% of the population leave the country. Uh, that's 
uh, not that many people, perhaps only just over 200,000, <laughs> uh, but, but it's, still, it's still massive. And I think uh, the fact that the EU forgot this is, is, uh, is very important, because list was, list was uh, clearly important. And the link between list and the Bolsheviks was this guy here, Sergei Witte who was minister, and the minister of finance in the last two Tsars, and he translated Friedrich List into Russian. Uh, so the Bolsheviks took over Witte's strategy and his bureaucracy. You know, they kicked out most of the bureaucracy of the Tsars, but, but, but Witte's office of industrialization was kept in place. So it was diversify out the raw materials into industry, maximize the division of labor and infrastructure. Witte, built the Trans-Siberian Highway, uh, Railway, Trans-Siberian Railway, which is probably the, you know, in the spirit of Friedrich List, you know, the, a, a huge, uh, perhaps the largest project in, in, until then. And there was a secret memorandum from Witte to the Tsar saying, well, I think we should worry less about these enormous extensions in Siberia. I think we should use more energy to develop the area around Moscow. Industrialize, right? So it was the intensive growth versus the extensive growth. So, so there is, you know, <laughs> you, even if you dig into Shanghai Czech in China, you will find that that list uh, that uh, list has been translated. So, I, and I think this is important that if you, if you look back at the Cold War, it was a game of emulation. It was first nation to the moon, just like. Kids, you know, first, who, first guy to run to the next corner. You know, typically children's emulation. And, and, and it was an emulation, you know, the, the Russians won with the Sputnik. I remember that, that was a shock. Uh, the Americans followed uh, a few uh, months later. But nobody told us that the Sputnik had gone around uh, and, and the first manned Russian spacecraft had gone around the world and the Americans just had gone up and down again. You know, I discovered that like 40 years later <laughs> because we were in this propaganda war, right? So, so that in a sense was a healthy thing about, um, about the, the, uh, the Cold War. Uh, it, it, was, it created an alternative uh, which made labor unions stronger um, and, kept, and kept wages up. So when industry disappeared, I'm going to show you some numbers here from from, from, from Russia. The axis is, is uh, the bottom axis is unfortunately lost, but this is 1992 to 2001. Reiner uh, Katlen, who speaks Russian, and uh, I did this uh, job a few years ago. 1991, there is no data from Russia. It was such a chaos, there is no data. Even in Mongolia, there is data from 1991, but, but not in Russia. So here you see the index of industrial production, 150 down to about 75. So industrial production is more than half. Right? We kind of knew that. But this is the index of agricultural production, which is also reduced by 50%. So not only did they stop making cars, they also stopped growing potatoes. Upa. This is the real average monthly accrued wages. So you see, in the beginning with free trade, real wages go up. And then industry starts dying out. Uh, you have a kind of a plateau here, and then you have a massive fall of the purchasing power in Russia, and you have uh, a gradual growth again. There was a rather well-known article in, in um, Lancet, the medical journal, which showed that the, average, the life expectancy of the average Russian male went down by about 14 years over this period. So it, 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 it actually was pretty devastating, right? Like we see today, or we saw last fall, that actually uh, the, the life expectancy of white middle-class American men is falling. You know, which is a bit of the same thing, which is, I, 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 it's, it, it's fairly dramatic. Uh, but the surprising thing here is 
the real exchange rate against the dollar. <laughs> so as industrial production is falling, as agricultural production is falling, the rise of the ruble, the, the value of the ruble compared to the dollar skyrockets. Maybe it has something to do with oil. But in whose interest would this be? Well, if you were the Mercedes dealer in Moscow, you would love this exchange rate, right? Because, because Mercedes cars become very, very cheap. And of course, if you are a Russian oligarch and want to get your money out uh, to uh, buy uh, houses in London or English soccer clubs, you know, this is the exchange rate you want. And this comes to a collapse in August um, 1997. Uh, and a Russian friend of mine, an economist, he said he had saved enough money to buy a car, and the next day he could buy a bicycle. Uh, but, and then you see how after devaluation, uh, real wages start growing again. Right? So many countries in the periphery of Europe have been through this. And this is related to deindustrialization and deagriculturalization and overvalued exchange rates. I presented this in, a, in, 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 in Moscow and the Russian economists they really don't have a good explanation. They, uh, they thought it's something that the court should take uh, hold of. But somebody made a lot of money from, 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 from speculation here. And that's, uh, I think it's, it, it's a dramatic development, especially when you know that, that uh, the average living age would, you know, was de decreased by more than 10 years. This is a graph by, from Branko Bilanovic. Uh, and it's interesting, I think. You know, these red uh, countries is uh, where income is below the 1989 levels. So in the Ukraine and Montenegro and Serbia, everyone makes less money than under the under the under communism. So, so is this an argu argument for communism? Obviously not. This is an argument for keeping an industrial sector. And, and, and you have um, Georgia. Georgia used to be a high-tech country like Estonia. But now almost everyone is poorer than they were uh, in, in, in 1989. And, they are, and the IMF says, well, it doesn't matter. We'll give you some money. And the debt is increasing and increasing and increasing. Uh, so... Some countries are doing, like Belarus, is doing very well. And the Ukrainians are asking themselves, you know, UK, Ukraine used to be a very rich, industrialized country. And now the real wages in, in, in Belarus are twice as high as ours. And Belarus is not a very simpatico country, you know. P politically, it's, it's not very nice at all, but... Uh, they say it's clean, and, and on the index of complexity, which Hausmann at Harvard made with somebody from MIT, Belarus gets a very high score, and Norway gets a very low score, because we're so specialized in oil. So, so there's, there's some lessons from this. Uh, to see it very bluntly, uh, it's better to have a very, it's better to have an inefficient manufacturing sector than not to have any manufacturing sector at all. <laughs> and, and Ukraine is the country shrinking fastest in the world. And they are not a million people. They are more than 40 million people. And if 20% leave, well, that's 8 million. Right? And, and so I think there's a potential, uh, there's a, there's potential dynamite here. <laughs> and, 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 and Belarus is interesting because they kind of kept the old-fashioned economic structure, which is not very efficient, but it's, it's better. It's better than, than uh, 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 the Ukraine and, and, and other countries who, 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 who deindustrialized fast. You have any comments on this? Questions? Yes? Uh, do you have this in a, in a paper or in somewhere we can find it easily? It, well, you find it easily by... by uh, 
uh, it's on Twitter from, <laughs> from um, what's his name, Branko Milanovic, who used, Branko Milanovic, who used to be an economist with the World Bank and is now at New York University, I think. You know, he has done some wonderful work on this. I think it's, it's, uh, it, it, it's fascinating. And, and if what we're worried about is, I think we should get to that. I think we should be worried about more than innovation. We should actually be, if, 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 if innovation means getting out of old fashioned industries, maybe then it's better not to innovate. <laughs> maybe it's, it's better to stick, to stick to be relatively efficient in an in, in, in industry which produces more. So what I call, you know, I try to say, well, what is it which unites cameralism and institutionalism and, and evolutionary uh, economists and the historic, German historical school? And I kind of called it the other canon, which is just a name. But what, we, what, we, what is important is that economic activities are qualitatively different from each other. I mean, this is the bad thing about Ricardo. He made all economic activities their life. Um, and that there must be a clear separation between the real economy and the financial sector. We don't have time to talk about that, but this is, this is clearly important. And, and uh, uh, if, if you look at Marx, my Marxist friends uh, say that, well, to, unfortunately, Marxists today don't get beyond volume one of Das Kapital. If they go to volume three, they would have an excellent explanation of financial crisis. So, so, so you know, from Schumpeter to the right, to Marx to the left, this separation of, of even you know, French economists, you know, the, the continental economists understood this division very well, wherever they were on the political um, spectrum. So innovation, to me, I'll give you examples for this, okay? To me, it's important that innovation spread in entirely different ways in the economy. And innovation can, can spread as high wages or as lower prices. And this is back to, back to Hans Singh in 1950, who says that the problem with raw materials is actually that, that uh, when we have innovations, wages don't go up, prices fall to the consumer. Right? So, so this, is, this is important and this comes out of development economics. Um, and then economic activities form institutions more than the other way around. So there is something about the arrow of causality here. I mean, it's, it's not that the Venetians discovered insurance so they could have long distance sailing. No, they had long distance trade and it, it was very messy that to distribute risk, they had 40 owners who owned two and a half percent each of the cargo. So they invented insurance, right? It's not that they invented property rights so that they could have a city. Well, they had a city and in order to, in order to uh, have order, they, they made a property register, a catasto around 1152 to 54, right? So I, I, there are things, when I go out in the world there and talk to the central banker of, 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 of the head of the central bank in Zimbabwe, he says, well, the IMF and the World Bank tells me that we have to get the institutions first and then, uh, then things will solve itself. No, I think they, uh, Richard Nelson puts it, the co-evolution of institutions and activities. I go even a bit further and I say that it's, it's, it's the activity that in, in induces the, inst the institution, right? If, if, if you are in manufacturing, well, then it will create, uh, it, it will create a demand for certain institutions. So, so the, this, this neoclassical institutionalism, I think, has a problem with the arrows of causality. And, of course, well, um, Capitalism has a tendency to suffer from underconsumption. You know, Hobson, 1880s. You know, it says law versus Hobson and underconsumption. So, so it's uh, uh, and and if says laws dominate, well, you 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 will have austerity. If 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 uh, Hobson dominates, you will understand that you need what you need is demand, right? Uh, you have a case, you get a Keynesian model. So last time these other canons surfaced was uh, with the Marshall Plan. And George Marshall, uh, I think, repeats Botero, in a sense. There's a face of, when he announced the Marshall Plan at Harvard in 1947, there's a face of this matter which is both interesting and serious. The farmer has always produced the foodstuffs to exchange with the city, dweller for all the necessities of life. 
this division of labor is the basis of modern civilization. That's a pretty strong statement. That, that the exchange between city and countryside is the basis of modern civilization. I think he happens to be right. Uh, but that, does, that limits the scope of free trade. If free trade ruins the cities, well, then free trade will reduce the wealth. At the present time, it's threatened with breakdown. And I think what caused this was, uh, in 1943, the Allied had, uh, had approved a plan presented by the US Secretary of State then, um, Henry Morgenthau, Jr. And the Morgenthau plan was to de-industrialize Germany. And Germany had created two world wars in, 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 in a century which was only, was not yet halfway. Uh, and the best way they thought of punishing Germany was to prohibit industry. Right? That was the Morgenthau plan. But then they, the Americans and the Allies understood that something was wrong because this Morgenthau plan was not in East Germany. So you actually had better living conditions in East Germany and the people from the Allied sectors moved East. So they sent out the wise old president, a bit like Carter today, who was who, uh, Herbert Hoover. And Herbert Hoover reported in his third report, a few months before the Marshall Plan, there is the illusion that the new Germany left after the annexations can be reduced to a pastoral state without industry. It cannot be done unless we exterminate or move 25 million people out of it. So then he continues to say, well, where should we move 25 million people today out of Germany? Uh, you know, should we move them you know, out? Uh, if so, where? Or, or should, we, should, we, should we kill them? You know? It, it, was, it was very blunt. And this report, uh, you know, this was the beginning of the Cold War. And, and if they, they understood that after this, you know, there was, there was this understanding that um, the best way to protect us from communism was to make the countries around the communist bloc as rich as possible. So they extended the Morgenthau plan, a kind of Morgenthau plan, to, to uh, Japan, to, Ty to South Korea, to Taiwan, all the way around to Turkey, uh, and Western Europe up to Norway. Right? And that um, Marshall Plan was uh, the beginning of this fantastic 30 years of growth that we had. I think this was the key argument that created the Marshall Plan. Well, how could Hoover know it, and how did he arrive at the number 25 million? Well, I think he looked at the population density of France, and he said, well, if we get rid of industry, it, it will be like France outside Paris. So, so he, he, that, that was the kind of estimate. We don't have that, but we have the correspondence with, with Hoover. So, so um, uh, Truman trusted Hoover very much, and I think rightly so. And Hoover was an interesting character. He was a mining engineer. And one of the things he did with his wife was to, was to translate a mining book from Latin to English, a book published in, the six, in 1600. So, you know, once, in a, once you had kind of intellectual precedence, which, which, is, which, which is interesting, and, and it produced very good results. So there is something here. You know, this was understood, and it was understood very well with the integration of Spain into the EU, and then it was stopped being understood, in a sense. Uh, and Hayek has an interesting overshooting mechanism. Um, never will man penetrate deeper into error than when he's continuing on a road which has led him to great success. Hayek. And this is like Hyman Minsky's destabilizing stability. You know, when things go very, go very well for a while, uh, you know, you cut corners and, and, and you reduce your margins, and then a little, uh, and then a little uh, mistake or a little crisis can throw the whole system into crisis. Right? So, so I'm saying that in a sense, if you apply Minsky's mechanism of destabilizing stability to economics, you, you get a similar phenomenon. And that economics gets more and more abstract, and then there is a crisis, and then the level of abstraction has to come down. And I think this is, this is where we are now. We are, in, and you are part of that period of bringing the level of abstraction down. Harold Innes, a uh, Canadian economist, has a similar mechanism. Science, communicated in Latin, gets more and more abstract and enters into alliances with political elites. 
So the academics ent enter into alliances with the political elites. Resistance to the ruling paradigm and the elites build up among the vernacular, those who don't know, write Latin, and an overthrow may take place after a shock to the system. Now, this, some of us thought that this would happen in 2008, and, 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 and it didn't. And Innes has an interesting, um, an, an interesting uh, addition to that. He said, Western civilization is again and again saved by knowledge that for a time only survives in the periphery. Think of financial crisis. If you thought there could be a financial crisis like Mr. Minsky thought, there were two places in the United States that you could get a job. University of Missouri, Kansas City, and Bard College, upstate New York. So if you thought there could, be, there could be a financial crisis and you thought that was interesting, then you would have to sacrifice a career at a good university. You sacrificed a career for doing something that you believed in. And, and, and uh, you know, with the financial crisis, Minsky is back, and Jan Kregel, who, who, who's teaching at this university, uh, and a few Minskians suddenly, suddenly become at the, at, at, at the uh, core of, of, of financial theory. So again, I see these this cyclical things. You know, things get more and more abstract, and then, they, they, uh, then theory collapses. And, and, and it did so in 1848. It did so in 1932, and I think it's doing or early 30s, and I think it's doing that again. Torsten Weblen, have you heard of Weblen? Yeah, you have, yeah. Weblen was a, a, an interesting economist of, 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 Norwegian, of Norwegian origin, working in the United States. And, and um, when I read him in the 1970s about capitalism, I thought he, he didn't describe the capitalism I knew. He died in 1929, three weeks before the crisis, after having foreseen it. But now, when I read, when, when I read uh, Veblen, I say, aha, now I understand him. This is the kind of capitalism that Veblen describes uh, uh, around the turn of the century. So he talks about esoteric knowledge, which is prestigious but fairly useless. And he, he talks about education contaminating healthy instincts. You have healthy young people put into university, and then their mind is being contaminated. And, and you, you get you know, factless economics. And then exoteric knowledge. Useful knowledge that carries little prestige. Fact and experience-based economics. So this is the, the level of abstractions, I think, where, 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 you, where, where you're going up and down. And of course, Schumpeter saw this pretty early. Um, Schumpeter writes in an introduction uh, to a, a book by a Danish author on monopolies, he says, the general reader will have to make up his mind whether he wants simple answers to his questions or useful ones. In this, as in other economic matters, he cannot have both. And I think this is very, this is extremely insightful. You know, Schumpeter's first book, Wesen und Hauptinhalt, the, the, the nature and main contents of economics, which was 1908, I guess, translated into Japanese in 1936, translated into English in 2010, he, he discusses the Methodenstreit between Austrian and, and, and German economics. And he says that in a sense, they are both right. What you have to do, you have, you, you have to bring your questions to the theory. And then you go into the theory at a level of abstraction where you're likely to get an answer. Right? And, and, and he, would, when he, he would say about Ricardo that Ricardo has an excellent theory which, which lacks nothing but sense. You know, uh, the, the, the old Schumpeter writing at, Har writing at Harvard during the war. Uh, so clearly, you can have theories that are too abstract. And, and making all economic activities alike, by, e by making world trade a system of bartering labor hours of the same quality, that is too abstract to be useful, right? So, so I think this is, this is extremely sensible. This is the young Schumpeter, this is essentially repeating this comes from his first book. So, um, you know, Schumpeter is the man to, 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 to go to also for these things. I think two, day, two blind spots today are, are, are financial crisis and persistent poverty. And of course, you know, Krugman comes up with an answer to, to these things in an interview with The New Yorker. I, said, I think there's a pretty good case to be made uh, that the stuff I stressed in the models is the less important story than the things that I left out because I couldn't model them. 
You know, I think this is this is an, a, a supreme insight, and 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 and, and you know the uh, as 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 a businessman, you know your you, your your financial statement are, are thousands and thousands of numbers, but only three or four are really important. And the skill is to see what three or four are really important. But, but this you can't do here, because maybe the most important ones are, 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 are not part of the model, because you couldn't model them. Right? This is, I think, uh, this is an argument also for lower, uh, lower um, levels of abstraction. So the, the old strategy, emulation, and then only then comparative advantage. This is, you know, no nation has ever grown rich without protecting manufacturing industry. England protected only for 400 years, Korea only for 40, but they've all done it, right? This is, this is the key. And here, of course, being boycotted helps. Uh, you know, South Africa was very much, and Zimbabwe was, was very much helped by, 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 by boycotts, because then uh, that's forced import substitution. If you have, a, if you have the skills and, and, and you have a, a reasonable big market, uh, I mean, the, the, the boycotts that came out of apartheid, apart from the lack of oil, which was a problem, you know, it, it developed both um, both South Africa and Zimbabwe developed because they because they, uh, uh, the boycott uh, was like a high tariff. So, so I think this is important that you can see that under certain circumstances, boycott can be positive. And I think that's why the West decided not to boycott Russian trade. Because Russia is such a big market and has reasonable technology that it would actually have helped them. I think that's why they chose the financial uh, boycott. And then Russia imposed, self-imposed a, boy a boycott, but, but on agriculture. So here again, the timing of free trade being very important. So when I went to school in Oslo, we had, was a country called Somalia, which was, which was richer than another country called Korea, South Korea. And then some, something suddenly takes off in Korea. And it's not that they get so much richer in producing rice. It is because they industrialize and the, and the price of labor goes up, so also rice production becomes much more efficient, right? So, so and you see, uh, Somalia sticks to its comparative advantage in being poor. I think it's, it's a, a comparative advantage in being poor is a real, is, 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 is a real fact. And we, kn we know what... Somalia is, is, is now an expert in, 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 in uh, uh, piracy, right? And they're doing reasonably well. Um, and, and, you know, I'm old enough to remember that Medellin in Colombia uh, was the most successful industrial city in Latin America, Medellin. And then you had an abrupt deindustrialization, and now Medellin is, is famous for drugs, right? So, so there is something there. Uh, I remember when, when we lived in Lima and, and, uh, and, and uh, the, the pediatrician said to my wife, um, if your children starve, do you steal or don't you steal? You know, it was this kind of very crude thing, but, but, but then you wonder why, poor, why were the poor are so honest. But this is, this is dramatic. You see the financial crisis there in, in the late 90s. And this is what we're not thoroughly understanding. We don't really know very well how to make middle income countries. String red herrings of kind of false starts. At the beginning they said get the prices right. A friend of mine became economic advisor to the Peruvian president Fujimori in 1990 and uh, the World Bank said no just get the prices right and get rid of the guerrillas and everything will solve itself. Uh, and it didn't. And then it was get the property rights right, get the institutions right, get the governance right, get the competitiveness right, get the innovation, entrepreneurship, education, climate, diseases right. Uh, you know, the, the climate argument is a very old one. You know, the, the lazy people live in the tropics. Well, look at, you know, Singapore is three degrees from the equator, right? And they're very, they're, they're very wealthy. So I'm saying the, the, the missing dimension here is, is get the economic activities right. So I'll, I'll finish with looking at what I call three slippery concepts, which you kind of meet every, all the time, but which I think you sh we should be more critical to. Competitiveness. Merkel pushes for boost to Greek competitiveness. Sounds pretty good, 
But what, what does it really mean? Productivity. Productivity isn't everything, but in the long run, it's almost everything. Paul Krugman. And innovation. Our objective is to develop policy initiatives aiming at the modernization of the EU industrial base through accelerating the uptake of innovations. This is typically EU talk, right? Competitiveness. If you looked up the com definition of competitiveness, OECD in 1992, competitiveness is a country that can produce goods and services that meet the test of foreign competition while simultaneously maintaining and expanding domestic income. So competitiveness used to mean getting richer while staying competitive. If you look up on the website, I looked up in 2015, competitiveness is a measure of a country's advantage or disadvantage in selling its product in international markets. So suddenly competitiveness means or in order to get more competitive, you have to reduce your wages. Whereas as the original definition of competitiveness was getting richer, now it's getting poorer. Right? And economists, World Bank, IMF people are throwing these concepts around and the EU is throwing these concepts around and, and the definition has been, after the crisis, this definition has been completely changed. I think this is, this is remarkable that 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 uh, that they can get away with that, that that's that's uh, that's incredible michael porter in his book of competitiveness had, by the way had a pretty, pretty bad definition but this always a d definition i think is, is is the one that was ruling for a long time productivity well the potential for productivity increases are highly activity specific you know i i was i was um, um, Corresponding with Moses Abramovich, who was a Stanford economist uh, who, who was educated long before the war. And he says, well, I really agree with you that of this activity specific thing about economic development. But in the 1930s, we all, all of us knew that. So this was something that was known, but has been forgotten. There is something called Ferdon's Law, Dutch economist, 1949 key link between a growth in output and growth in productivity. This is kind of logical. That where the output is bigger, it increases the most, uh, productivity increases the most. I mean, you can say only because they have to buy new machinery all the time. And then there is Beaumont's law, that some economic activities, productivity increases are virtually impossible without reducing the quality. So if you are, if you want to make the symphony orchestra more productive, you can either ask them to play the minute waltz in 50 seconds, that reduces the quality, and you can play it with a smaller orchestra. In both cases, you, you reduce the quality. Right? So, so some economic activities are very difficult to improve in terms of productivity. And many things that are in the public sector, for instance, taking care of old people, uh, this Bomol's law requires, uh, uh, is valid. It doesn't, it's, it's not valid, for instance, in type, some types of eye surgery. There are incredibly economies of scale. If you get the pa patients lined up, the doctor can, can, every five minutes can operate an eye, uh, certain type of eye disease, right? So in, in some medical things, there are tremendous imp productivity improvements, but others not. But this is something we're not talking about. We, we tend to be using this Beaumont's law to clobber the public sector, right? And, and, and that's an unsophisticated way of doing it, I think. So this is something which came out of National Bureau of Economic Research in 1942. Here are 51 industries comparing output and wage earners and wage earners per unit, that is productivity, between 1899 and 1937. So if you look here, the, the, the automotive industry, the output increased by almost 200,000%. The number of wage earners went up by 20,000%. And the wage earners per unit of product, product, you know, the wage earners needed to produce one car went down by 85%. Right? So, this is an economic activity where there's a lot of possibilities for, uh, for uh, productivity increase. 
And it was also a, uh, an industry with a large uh, concentration, which comes out of this. Um, there were a couple of hundred car factories in the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, 40 years later, there were four. Right. 50 years later, there were four. So here you have chemicals, petroleum refining, beet sugar, pr fruit and vegetables, etc., etc. Here on the, on, on, on the ones with very little productivity increase and very little uh, uh, growth in output. You have uh, carriages, wagons and sleighs, locomotives, linen goods, uh, turpentine and raisins, etc. Right? So, and hats is over here. You know, 42 is hats. So, so if, you are, if you are in a city producing hats, you know, the possibility for productivity increase is very low. If you are in a, if you're producing cars, the, p the potential is huge. And I, I, we're not, this is not, in my view, not being flagged enough. In this very room on Thursday, the head of IMF Europe was talking, and in sensible talk uh, about the lack of, uh, <laughs> the, 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 the lack of uh, convergence in Europe. Uh, but still, there was no, nobody enters into what's, act, you know, what's the composition of this, what's the composition of this industry, right? Today you would have Silicon Valley out there and, and you would have the maquilas in Mexico out here. Because what's happening is that in the economic activities where there is little productivity increase, they appear as being labor intensive and if they're labor intensive, they're farmed out to the third world. So the third world would tend to get these bad, bad activities. And Ferdon's law is, is, is the, 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 the link between those two bars to the left, right? That, that where there is productivity, where there is increase in, in um, where there is increase in output, there is also tend to be increase in productivity. And then we get to something I mentioned that the fruits of increased productivity will spread to the economy in two different ways. I call it the classical mode. That's what Ricardo said when in the third edition of his Principles of Economics, he, he decided he had to write something about machinery. And he said, what happens with machinery is that prices will fall, right? Uh, which, is, which is the case with perfect competition, of course. And the collusive mode, I call it collusive, the higher profits and higher wages to the producers, right? So, uh, As with productivity increase, the windows of opportunity for innovation will vary vastly from one economic activity to the other. Carlota Perez, who is coming after, uh, after me, has this, this window of opportunity. Window of opportunity, I think, is very important. At one point, there is a window of opportunity for, um, for growth in the cotton spinning. 300 years later, it's in information technology. Um, in the United, I'll show you the example of baseballs and golf balls. And you have uh, some systemic effects, you see in Haiti, Moldova, uh, you, you, you find depopulation, you find that uh, um, the young children stay behind with their, pe with their grandparents and, and the, the parent generations move out. You know, this is all a result of these, you know, here the difference in potential in innovation is, not, is very important. If you look at economic growth, it is, this is a, this is a graph from Carlotta. Uh, the average annual increase in productivity in cotton spinning in the 17, late 1750s, you know, in England was more than 25% a year. More than 25% productivity increase every year. And then, you know, this comes down and then productivity increase is very low. In computing, you have something similar called Moore's Law, saying that the, the, the productivity of the chip doubles every 18 months or whatever it is. And then, of course, you have something that looks like that. Right. So if you decompose economic growth over time, you will, you, you will find that it really consists of these productivity explosions. 1990s, it was, uh, it, it, it was computing, uh, and, and that probably still goes on. Uh, now, well, Carlotta will talk about what, 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 what the next possibilities are. But that's important. And you will find that economists, the continental economists, 
were very, especially German ones, they, the so-called camera list, they were in charge of collecting taxes. And if they managed to get this kind of activity inside their country, you know, not only were the businessmen making money, but the workers here would also make much more money. So from the point of view of taxation, you wanted to get hold of an industry that looked like that. Right? So, so, and, and the English traders were looking at this from a trading point of view, and they came to pretty similar conclusions. But it's interesting, notice that English economists tend to be traders, they tend to be merchants, or Adam Smith was a former customs official. They focus on that, whereas continental economists tend to, tend to especially from the German lands, they tend to come from, uh, from ministers of finance in the small countries. So this is a typical uh, graph. This is a typical learning curve um, from US Bureau of Labor Statistics. Man hours required by best practice method of producing a pair of medium grace men's shoes at selected dates in the US. 1850, 15 and a half hours, 1900, 1 1.7, 1923, 1.1, and then 1.9. So this is another way of drawing that the explosion from, from the last graph. And here, the United States was a big shoe producer. And, and, and United Shoe Machinery and other companies were in St. Louis, Missouri, which became rich. And then the learning curve uh, kind of flattens out. And as I said, these flat learning curves tend to be associated with labor-intensive products, and they are automatically farmed out. So the maquilas in northern Mexico are the kind of economic activities that the Americans are not able to mechanize, right? because the learning curve is flat. So the laws of the market will assign the economic activities with, where there's very little learning to poor countries. That's why poor countries don't have the same productivity increase, because they, they tend to be specialized in economic activities where there is very little productivity increase. Right? So rich countries export from steep learning curves uh, and import from flat learning curves. My first job as uh, uh, after my PhD was for an American consulting firm called Telesis. And we had a job in Ireland and as advisor to the Prime Minister of Ireland. And the Irish Prime Minister was an accountant. You know, Ireland had been a member of the EU since 1973. They only got a lot of debt. Nothing happened. Farmers with debt. And, and this Prime Minister Hoy, he said to us, the uh, consultants, uh, that I see a new technology out there. I want information technology. I want Ireland to be number one in that technology. So it was enlightened. This was the first time I thought of really enlightened despotism. And, and we came running, we the consultants came running with the learning curves and all the other stuff and said, yes, this is what you should do. You know, uh, here, <laughs> here Ireland grabs this new economic activity and runs down the learning curve ahead of other countries and, and, and you make it. And that was, that was reasonably su successful, right? Uh, and Ireland actually uh, was a very successful um, uh, country in information technology. And Finland uh, grabbed cellular phones and, and, and ran in the same way. Right? Uh, and and that, that they happened to be the two last colonies of Europe, ex except the, the ones the colonies in the Soviet <coughs> Union. So the last two colonies of Europe actually were very successful in new industries. So it's you don't have to be number one in steam to be number one in electricity. Uh, as Carlotta will tell you, it's rather the other way around, that if you, if you, um, if you are strong in the old industry, you will, you, know, it's, it, you will be weak in a new one. It's not the producers of radio tubes that invent the transistors. Right? So this is, this is things Carlotta will talk about. So I have... Advi I have made this kind of product quality index of economic activities that very high quality product in terms of, develop uh, uh, in terms of producing development is new knowledge with high market value, steep learning curves, high growth and output, etc., etc. So you had shoes up there for a while and now shoes are down there. You have golf balls in the United States which are 
produced in New Bedford, Massachusetts, I think the big company still is, making salaries are $15 an hour. And then you have it, an absolute technological dead end, which is baseballs. Baseballs are still hand-sewn. They used to be made in Haiti at 50 cents an hour. Now they're made in Nicaragua, Costa Rica, where it's more stable, but still, I mean, the low wages in this activity is linked to its inability to innovate, right? So, so if you go to, the, if you go to uh, Costa Rica and say, why don't, why don't you innovate? Well, because nobody else managed to, to innovate. This activity is in Costa Rica because we, it's impos it was impossible to innovate in the United States. So I think this is an, a, 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 a way of, of nuancing the innovation argument that, that, hey, there are some dead ends out there. And if we, which is similar to this one, right? So the high quality activity will be the ones to the left here. If, if you want, you can ask uh, Olga to get the this, this, this slides. So, last slide. I've been talking too much when, and you have too few questions. To, don't give you enough questions. Up to 1992, the ben benefits of the single market. In 1988, the, e the, uh, the EU produced the Cecchini Report, an Italian economist by the name of Cecchini. And the benefits of a single market. This was the whole ideology for why we needed a single market. And if you go into the report, uh, you will find that you know, agriculture was out of this. Agriculture was something you had to subsidize anyway, so you didn't want to talk about that. Uh, Europe was largely conceived as an eco economy dominated by manufacturing industry. And benefits from, single, from the single market was to a great extent seen as resulting from economies of scale. That if they extended their markets from being national markets to European markets, the cost would fall. Very logical argument. So he calculates around, it's not crystal clear because he has a couple of numbers, but seemingly at one point he thinks that 85% of the benefits from the single market is due to increasing returns. And of course, also then the innovations related to that. You know, the EU, EU was talking about innovation. There was a white paper on innovation around the same time. Well, yeah, and there was a green book on innovations, et cetera, et cetera. But a lot of it was, was tied to manufacturing and a lot of it was tied to scale. So if you had told Mr. Cecchini, what if manufacturing industry dies out in some of the member countries? Had this, had this question be asked, the obvious answer would have been that the countries that kept their manufacturing industries would benefit disproportionately from the single market compared to those who lost them. Right? This is in the foundation logic of the single market. But, but you say, well, Portugal has vir lost virtually all its manufacturing sector. Greece, same thing. And, and in, this, in this logic of of the European Union, they actually, they should have been able to see this if they'd gone back to the sources, being Mr. Cecchini. So, so there is uh, the unwillingness to disaggregate the data into different economic sector, you know, produces uh, many of the problems in, 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 in the periphery. You know, the, the, the deindustrialization of Latvia, 25% of the pop more than 20% of the population lost, uh, uh, left the country, the Ukraine, and the partnership that the EU has with these neighboring countries is pretty bad. You know, the countries, you know, from the Ukraine to Georgia, um, they are, um, they have a partnership agreement, and the EU is supposed to buy their agricultural product but their, their quotas are so, they force them to keep, stay in agriculture, but the quotas they give them are so miserably small that they run out in February. Right. So, so the, the, the story of the non-EU countries is, 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 is reasonably bad. And also some of the EU countries like Romania, where you, know, you, you have uh, the food chain, uh, like 
uh, Aldi and these uh, German food chains who have their purchasing office in Germany and in France, they flood the markets in Eastern Europe uh, so, so, and they, they, they don't buy food locally. So even though you know, a country like Romania is very, has a very high uh, uh, productive agricultural sector traditionally, you, know, you have to go to the small markets to, 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 to get them. And the Romanians are arguing that the guy, the, 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 the guy who's in charge, the, the, the prime minister of Romania, is the former agricultural commissioner of the European <laughs> Union. And, and the people there are saying, you know, the, we have a group of politicians who are more interested, who are more loyal to the European Union than to Romania. So, so there is some, you know, I think we, we, we're going to see more of this. So, so, so I think that uh, uh, when there is a crisis, uh, we, it has to get worse before it gets better. And I, so my, 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 my hope is that it will get worse very fast because then we can get over it. <laughs> so, because a revision is being needed. And the revision isn't, you know, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We have to go back the way we were thinking in, in, in 1947. That's, that's, uh, that's all. So, sorry to talk so much, but we still have time for some questions. So please, questions, comments, something totally unrelated, whatever. <laughs> And as I said, I think this is pretty independent of right and left, which is, which, 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 is, which is interesting. You know, this, this, uh, uh, this whole logic. If you see, um, uh, if you see uh, 1848 was an interesting year, a bit like now. Um, there were hun the, hun the hungry 1840s, and then there was a revolution in all large European countries ex except England and Russia. And you had Marx and Engels' Communist Manifesto. You had a German uh, economist called Hildebrandt. And you had John Stuart Mill, who recanted on free trade. So the English liberalists understood that actually a country needed what was called infant industry protection. That was, that was John Stuart Mill's work. And now, so, the, so the, let's say the, the, the views of the elite collapsed because they were attacked from both right and left both from Marx and Engels and from John Stuart Mill. And I think there is something similar here now. You know, free trade in the United States is being attacked, attacked both, both by Trump and Sanders. Yeah. And I think that's kind of healthy. If there's something good to say about Trump, I think it's that he stopped that hypocrisy uh, of, 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 of talking free trade and doing something different. So, so <laughs> which is what the rich countries have always done. They have pretended they have free trade and then they've done something completely different. So, so at least he stopped the hypocrisy. I mean, if, we, if we're looking for good sides. You had a question? Or? No. Yes. yes um, you mentioned the Botero's quote about you have to count the number of professions to measure the level of innovation in the city. Uh, but I was, think, I was thinking about what Enrico Moretti wrote about the city and Valley being specialized in one sector equal the innovation sector. So can you... Who is this? Moretti. He's an economist. Yeah. Specializing on, in housing, on housing markets. And um, the fact in Silicon Valley is that there are less professions, actually. Uh, there's no financial sector, for instance, because and as opposed to New York City, where technology startups have a hard time taking off because people are always attracted to higher uh, levels of income in the financial sector. So Silicon Valley uh, has isolated from every other profession and focused only on uh, computer science and design and other things is actually more innovative as a result. So how do you reconcile? Well, well I, I think you can reconcile it with, with, in a sense, with the death of distance. Uh, that th that uh, you don't need to have the bank around the corner anymore. It can be in New York, and 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 and, and you can you can do it. And um, well, there are industrial, you know, in 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 Italy, you you will find that there are industrial cities which are which are very specialized these days. You know, you look at the button industry. There's one little place in northern Italy where they where they only produce buttons. So 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 there are. Uh, 
th there are clusters which are less uh, uh, dependent on, 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 on distance, that's sure. And, and these industrial districts in Italy, if we're talking about that, you have, uh, they are of course also specialized. But, but if, you, if you go back in time, uh, you, you find that, uh, uh, that the diversity was, was, was a key argument. And, 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 they, and especially Serra dis describes the virtue circle. You know, because there are so many separate uh, businesses each specializing, they attract a lot of customers. And because they attract a lot of customers, volume goes up and prices fall. And prices fall, they can increase their wages and still lowering their prices, which will attack even more people. So it, it, you know, he describes these, these rounds of virtuous circles. But at, at the core of these is, is our, are, are increasing returns. But it's interesting what you say about the Silicon Valley and the distance. It was like that with, with, the, with the cotton industry in England. And they say, well, why didn't that, why wasn't, didn't that happen around London? And, and one, of the answer, one of the answers is that labor was too expensive. And another one was that uh, they had the uh, entrepreneurship up there, which they have further south. But, but it's interesting how English industry developed pretty independently from the city of London. So th there, might, there might be a parallel there with Wall Street and, uh, and, uh, and Silicon Valley. So, so I think the death, the death of distance will do something. And, 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 and the thing here is, it is, will the death of distance be the possibility why people sitting all around the world going back to kind of a communal mode of production? Uh, that, that, that is a possibility. And I think if we look at that, uh, if we look at these new phenomena of, 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 in, uh, or, or, or with new technologies, it, it might be useful to see it in this, in this perspective that these are people going back to re reciprocity. Uh, you know, I do you a favor and you do my a favor, which was the basis of, the, of a, any primitive clan. Right? This is, uh, reciprocity was, was the name of the game. Yeah. I have a, maybe a complicated question, maybe a simple question, I'm not sure how you'd like to approach it, but um, you were bringing up free trade um, as perspective that uh, economics is, uh, has simply accepted the fact that free trade is good without understanding in which context, if you have history of thought or history of ideas, uh, there are very different opinions depending on the context of why it was brought up and so forth, and we've lost that ability. But uh, I'm not sure if you're suggesting that uh, free trade is bad. Um, but it, it, I think that's, I think you, if I understand you correctly, we're just opening up the possibility that Free trade is not always good, and protectionism might be good in other instances, depending on the context. That's, that's correct. I would like to ask you the question about trade is thought of, at least in the modern context, as uh, nation states trading with each other, and I'm wondering if that concept is even compatible uh, with the, the modern development of the last 30 years of um, global value chains, uh, trade not necessarily happening within the traditional boundaries of one country block trading with another country block, uh, but rather multinationals. Also, the currency is no longer uh, it's, it's primarily driven through the US dollar uh, markets, for instance, and not within uh, the traditional markets. I'm wondering, if we're not talking about left or right uh, policies on trade. I'm just wondering, do we have the right dimensions, the right primaries about thinking about trade and the benefits of trade within, within any of the existing theories um, that, that might give us an indication whether trade is good or not. Um, Umtad had a term uh, in the 50s, symmetrical trade. And, 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 and symmetrical trade is always good. If, you know, uh, countries at the same level of development uh, are all, will always be interested in, have interest in, in trading between them. Uh, and of course, uh, the existence of increasing returns is a tremendous argument in favor of free trade. And, and Paul Krugman actually, around 1980, uh, wrote on trade and he rediscovered increasing and diminishing returns 
uh, and he said, uh, oh, the development economists were right and Lenin was right and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then he stopped talking about diminishing returns. So, so Krugman opened Pandora's box around 1980 and then he closed it and has been sitting on the lid ever since, right? Again, you know, you wouldn't get a Nobel Prize if you said that trade could be bad under some, some circumstances. But his 1980 theories actually did that. And just juxtaposing positioning, increasing and diminishing returns, you have an argument for when, when trade is, 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 is not positive. And, and the, the, the symmetry is, is, uh, is, is, is a key, key argument. So, so, you know, in the Ukraine, I cannot say that it would be in the interest of the Ukraine and Russia to trade, probably because they're on the same level, have pretty similar technology, but politically that's not possible to say. Uh, so, and the problem, of course, is that poor countries have very little to trade from each other. You know, they, they're not swapping cassava routes, you know. So, so um, uh, you know, so List has, Friedrich List has his argument. First, you need free trade to change, to, to change uh, people's uh, preferences to create a market. Then you have to protect to have industry grow, and then you have you need free, free trade again. I think this is this is this is still this is still valid. Uh, and 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 the professions, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Verri, an Italian economist, said in 1770 that that uh, manufacturing would cure. Uh, the, the worst ills of mankind, which is slavery and, and superstition. <laughs> and, and actually, if, 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 you, if you look at uh, you know, the Muslims in Singapore versus the Muslims in the desert, you know, they, 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 it, it's, it's very clear that your mode of production will influence your culture. Right? And, and I think this is, uh, this is, this is important. Um, the, 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 uh, Régis Debray was a, was a French... Uh, is now an elderly French philosopher. He's just, just written a book uh, in defense of borders. I don't think it has been translated into uh, uh, into English, but in Spanish and Ita French, Spanish and Italian. And his argument is that if we if we want to avoid walls, we should reintroduce borders, right? And and clearly, the nation state is still important because it's a labor market. So, so uh, the nation state is, is, is important. And all, remember, all the, all the redistributive mechanisms in society are still inside the nation state. The health sector, the school system, that's still inside the nation state. And EU declared from the beginning it wouldn't, didn't want to be a transfer union, but it's, it's kind of being forced in, 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 into being it. So, so I think it, it, it's back into this the, the connection between economic structure and population density. So we have a choice either to move economic activities or, or move people. According to FAO, there are about around 900 million people who, who uh, suffer from hunger and malnutrition. 900 million people. And, and I think, you know, uh, we can either take those 900 million people uh, to the West or we can take the same economic activities that made us rich there. And, 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 and of course, that's... And the, pro the, the problem is that the people who are most afraid of immigrants in Europe are also the people who are most in, 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 against free, in favor of free trade. So, so you have a political problem there. <laughs> that, 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 uh, so, but I... I, I I, I think this link between population density, I mean, in Iraq, in the, seven, in the 70s, there were, GDP per capita was about 7,000 7, US dollars. It had to do with oil and things like that. By the time we started the Iraq war, it was down to 3,000. And, and part of it was oil, but part of it was also deindustrialization. And if you contrast what the West did with Japan, with Japan after World War II, where the new dealers came from the US and, and rebuilt Japan, what we have been doing in, I say we, because you know, Norway is also a coalition of the willing there, what we have been doing in the Middle East is pretty disastrous. You know. Bombing for democracy was never a good idea. 
uh, because you because you 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 ruin it even more. And countries like Afghanistan are tribal societies, just as all European societies were before industrialization. You know, they they don't they have nothing to trade it with each other. Back to Marshall's argument <laughs> that the that the, the trade between city and countryside is the basis of civilization. So I think. Uh, Neoclassical economics has really uh, carried us f into, you know, into some pretty bad territory. And, and, and as I say, I, I hope it gets worse fast. <laughs> yes. Oh, there was your the lady first. Yeah. And in the list of the concept of competitiveness, productivity, innovation, and today I will maybe add entrepreneurship. So since you were a former entrepreneur, do you have an implicit theory of uh, entrepreneurship? Is it important to imagine them? And how would you look at it from a critical perspective? And the second question is, as young scholars, what is the window of opportunity for us? Because you did a, I mean, your whole work is to reread the history of academic thought, to retry peripheral knowledge. But now, in uh, each of our subfields, um, what's a research agenda? Except for, say, for the work to happen. Okay. Well, going I mean, back 40 years, hmm? which is what you suggested, and going back 40 years in terms of policy. Yeah, re re reinvent that wheel, yeah. which was so successful. Yeah. Do we have another option? <laughs> reinvent the Havana Charter. The Havana Charter was the beginning of the WTO. And they said, well, if a country is far from its production possibility frontier, it can have a tariff until everyone is employed. If it has, if a country has an industrial strategy, it can protect that, that strategy. You know, the Havana Charter, which was approved by all the members of, of the UN, was a great thing until the US Senate disapproved of it. <laughs> but, but, I mean, seriously, the stuff after World War II was, 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 was really brilliant. It, 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 it was excellent. Entrepreneurship, I'm with, completely with Schumpeter. Schumpeter's theory of economic development, that, that you know, money has no value kind of thing, right? It's, it, I mean, if there was no innovations, uh, every investment could be covered by uh, depreciation. You know, if everything, what, what companies did was only to maintain what they had, everything could be financed by depreciation. So according to Schumpeter, money the only thing which gives value to money is entrepreneurship. So he very clearly differentiates between entrepreneurship and, 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 and capitalists. And I think that's, that's very useful. Well, you can argue with Schumpeter. Well, the fact that you live today and may get a brick in your head tomorrow would make money more valuable today than tomorrow. I mean, there, there, there are some arguments there. But he, I think it's, that's an interesting point, that it's actually innovations which, gives, which should give capital value. Uh, th this is his first. Uh, th this is his, his first book. So I think entrepreneurship is 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 is, uh, is crucial. You know, ab absolutely, and and you would you see in the in in the early European literature they had different names for it, but this is what they were. This is this is what 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 what, what they were what they were talking about. And and in the feudal society, in order to in order to retain power, you had you were fighting for the status quo. Right? You were fighting for keeping things as they were. And with capitalism, the only way to continue to make money would be, was to innovate. And this is the key, the, this is why capitalism is so productive. This is like this phrase from, you probably heard from Alice in Wonderland. You know, this is how fast you have to run here in order to stand still. <laughs> this is how fast you have to innovate in order to keep making money. This is the beauty of the system. There, there is, therefore, I think it's so ugly that some nations specialize in things where it's impossible to innovate. And then we blame them because they don't innovate. I mean, I, th that goes against my sense of justice. Uh, so, so I think this differentiating is, is, uh, is important. And what the next field is going to be, you have to ask Carlotta, who is coming now any minute. <laughs> but the interesting thing is that even people who were very close to it, didn't see it. I mean, Werner von Siemens, who was a big entrepreneur in electricity, said, yes, we'll have electricity in factories, but don't think we'll have it in every home. 
Mr. Watson, who was the head of IBM, was saying that, um, well, maybe, maybe we need five or six supercomputers in the world. You know, he, he, he couldn't dream of, 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 of personal computers or telephones or things like that. And, and the people who invented the, the steam engine, the steam engine for many, many decades was only an engine, was only a water pump. And then somebody took that water pump and put it on trains or, and, and all other things, right? So the beauty of it is, is actually, that, in a way, the charming thing about it is that even the people who are very close don't see it, right? And, and uh, an American uh, economist said, it's like being on a ship in the fog and uh, something, some kind of gestalt is coming out of the fog and the first person to see what it can be used for wins. So that was kind of Bill Gates. You had this new technology which was kind of was not very, very well understood. It wasn't invented by Bill Gates, but he is the one who sees the win of opportunity, right? So, so I think this is, uh, th this is clearly important. And I, and I don't believe in, I, I, I must say, I don't believe in zero growth. I, I, I think, well, back to this graph. Um, I, I looked at the price of a transatlantic telephone call in 1930. Three minutes between London and New York. And in today's money, that would be something like 5,000 pounds. Well, if you can do this now for free with video on Skype, what does that mean for economic growth? Does it mean degrowth? It means that we, we cannot m measure what we're doing anymore, right? So that's one thing we have to think about. We, we, we have to, to stop trusting what we measure. We, we still trust it too much, I think. And, 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 and a lot, we, we get a lot of invisible growth. And maybe that is going back to this non-market non -market thing. Yes, a couple of more questions, then we let Carlotta come in. Yes, we've uh, we talked a lot, or you've talked a lot about uh, agriculture and manufacturing. I was wondering uh, how do services fit in your theory of development? For example, in Estonia, I think a lot of people would say that instead of needing to really industrialize, Estonia needs more high knowledge intensive services and things like that. So I was wondering if you could comment on that. Yeah. Well, services definitely find, uh, uh, fall into two categories. You know, the classical services, which are labor intensive, and all the barbers and all these things, and modern services, where there is tremendous possibilities for, in, for, for, for increasing returns. So I'm trying to say the, the thing is not that it has a physical weight. The thing is not that it is a product. The, 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 the thing is really increasing returns. And for hundreds and hundreds of years, incre increasing returns meant manufacturing and increasing returns on imperfect competition. Now you have the same thing in services, absolutely. But it's again, it's back to barriers to entry. You know, that, that uh, you know, the, the barber or the house painter is very different from Bill Gates, although they could still be in services. So, so clearly, ab absolutely. And I think uh, William Petty, who, who wrote in the 1600s, was, was saying there is a law that first agriculture will grow, then manufacturing will grow, and then services will grow. Why he saw that? How he saw that 300 years ago by looking at Holland is not clear to me, but he, he formulated this Petty's law, and I think that's, that is applying. But, but I think the really poor countries of the, of the world, they, they still need some goods. So although manufacturing may be diminishing here, that, that isn't applied to, to everywhere. So, so the key is really increasing returns. And you can make the same quality index for, for, for services. And there was one more question back there. Since we went back on the scheme and all the Polani argument, even going to reverse and transformation, um, is there a way um, that we can see uh, a growth being bound to activities that are of the non market sphere of the economy and be as finance any role to play in that part of uh, activities? Yeah, I, I, I think just. Uh, uh, I think this, this non-market will grow, but, but one of the reasons it grows is that we don't, uh, you know, one of the characteristics is that we don't really, we don't measure it. Had we measured uh, GDP by number of hours cr talked across the Atlantic, it would have skyrocketed. But since we don't measure it anymore, it's, it's, uh, 
uh, it's gone. And, and clearly, you know, the financial sector, I think, is, 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 is still there, but, but I think we have to go back to, 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 uh, to Schumpeter and, and, uh, and, and uh, you know, Schumpeter's view on the, on, 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 the, on the crisis was very different from everyone else. You know, Keynes idea that, oh, here demand is failing, we have to create demand, the government has to create demand, that was fairly intuitive. Schumpeter's view on that uh, was not as intuitive. He's, he was the only one actually said that financial crises are like a healthy cold shower for the economy because it lets those projects that should die out, it lets them go bankrupt. And, and, and one of the reasons is that we haven't listened to, we haven't listened to him. So we, we, we have to be, you know, finance clearly has, the risk taking of finance clearly has a role, but, but, um, um, but we have to, to separate the creative finance for the, from the, uh, should we say, parasite finance. Right? This, 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 is, uh, this is important. And that was, of course, done in the 30s with the, with the legislation in the United States, you know, separating speculative banking from, 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 from other banking. I see by Olga's view that we have to stop. <laughs> so, so thank you very much, and, and uh, if you, well, we'll see each other for dinner, so. <laughs>